I've been in lockdown here at the ballroom at Atlantis, the pub. I've converted it into the largest art studio in the world. My dream is that this painting will become the largest painting to have ever been created on canvas by a single artist. I want to do that through the hearts, minds and souls of the children of the world. Within my painting will be large circular portals in which I will paste the children's artwork from all over the world. These will act as windows or portals leading us to a better tomorrow through the souls of our children. And my dream is that this auction will raise $30 million from the sale of those panels. And with that money and the help of our charity partners, we will fund vital projects within the most in need and desperate areas of the world within the sectors of health and education. One child has the power to transform a whole community. It is the next generation who will inspire humanity to greater things. Will you stand with them? One world, one soul, one planet. We stand together united, humanity inspired. Let's paint the world a different color. We stand together, united. And hello there, and what an exceptional video. Um, I've been watching that over and over again, and there you have an entire story of humanity unfolding in front of you. What do we say? Sasha Jaffrey joins me now. I'm absolutely delighted. I'm you know, beyond excited at this interview because there are so many elements to this. Sasha, a million thanks. Thank you for being here with the ABLF. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Edna. This is this is really, really special. I've been watching the great work that you've been doing. It's been unfolding on, you know, various media outlets here in Dubai. There's been tremendous buzz around it. And, and so there should be. The entire ballroom of the Atlantis Hotel, not a bad place to be a sort of hold up for a while, but, you know, you've been immersed in paint and stories and joy and probably frustration at times and all. Bring us through this process. It's been an incredible journey, I'm sure. And tell us why. Sure. Um, so let me start firstly by saying hello, everyone. Um, Forgive me for my physical <laughs> attire. I'm a little tired. Um, it's been it's been ten long months, um, and I'll tell you how it all started. I I was actually I was starting my world tour um, of my 18 year retrospective that was going to 35 countries, um, and it was going to be the largest uh, ed retrospective in history. And it was very exciting. I was doing the Olympic painting. I was doing a painting for the Expo in Dubai, and then obviously we got hit by something that we weren't ready for. Um, but something really interesting happened. I felt that up till that point, so I was in Dubai. I spent most of my time between Dubai, London, New York, and Singapore. And I spent sort of three months in each in my studios, creating work and you know working out of those countries. And I'm always in Dubai, February, March, for that sort of powerful couple of months for Dubai's art season. And I was here and then suddenly, boom, we were locked down. And something really beautiful happened, I think. It was, I felt up to that point, our world had become full of static. And by that, I mean, if human beings are made of energy, which, which we undoubtedly are, um, if we're omitting this, this energy that really at times was, was not very helpful for society, for humanity, for people in general, we were emitting an energy full of agenda. We were focusing on the end goal and not the journey itself. We were thinking, how can I achieve what I need to achieve? How can I get here? I don't care about who I hurt along the way or who I affect in a negative way on that journey. I just need to be here. And we became obsessed with living our best life. All that nonsense we have to endure on Instagram, that, that idea of the instant, instant gratification. And, and how can we live our best life? And we were engaging the ego to such an extent 
and we were becoming so selfish, self-centered, and egotistical to an extent where we were damaging not only our environment, but also humanity itself. Where we come from, the soul of the earth, was getting damaged. And to, by that process, the world had become full of static because everywhere you looked and felt, there was this static energy around us um, in this crazy digital age that, that, that we, we live in. And suddenly, something extraordinary happened because in static, we can't communicate. If we're communicating through energy, we can't communicate through this static. But suddenly, COVID-19 hit the world and it didn't hit one country, one continent, it hit the world and the static left our world, and it left the entire world. And for that moment, there was a silence that was so beautiful, and I felt this silence needs to be heard. And at that moment, something incredible happened, and it, and it was with great irony that it happened, because we had actually become incredibly disconnected as humanity. Although we thought we, thought we, were, we were so connected with, with Instagram and with these ways of connecting on social media, in reality, we weren't. We'd become so disconnected from each other, from ourselves, from the soul of the earth, from our creator, whoever he or she is. And at that point, the static had left and we reconnected. And it was an incredible moment. And that's when I thought this silence needs to be heard. This connection needs to be, um, we need to make something of this moment. There is an opportunity for change, real change. And if we don't change now, we never will. But at the same time, a huge amount of people lost their lives. A lot of families were torn apart. A lot of people suffered financial crippling that they couldn't afford to suffer. There was pain and loss in our planet. And I felt we owe it to those people that have lost their lives to make a change, a collective change, a societal conscious change on every level, which we needed to make. And I felt this was an opportunity to create a painting and go on a journey that could evoke that change. And that's when I laid down what ended up being the largest canvas in the world on the Atlantis ballroom floor. We gutted the ballroom, thanks to the vice president, Tim Kelly, who supported us and helped us do this through a complete leap of faith. He just felt something and knew that we should go with it. And we laid down this huge canvas and I began. And that's really how it all began. And from there, something magical happened. I mean, it is, it's quite extraordinary to see all the elements of it. And indeed, you know, taking the time to look at every little piece. I mean, you must be still even looking back and thinking, oh, I forgot about that moment. Look at what that means. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, and it is, you know, hashtag humanity inspired. But also you worked with some, you know, leading NGOs as well. So you're bringing a lot of humanity and there's a lot of your heart and soul into this, you know, just as you've described as well. Bring us through that process. So we were actually, I mean, a lot of incredible things happened. It started as a painting. Um, and we, we were approached, I, I wanted to create a painting that would reconnect us to the soul of the earth. As I said, I felt we'd become disconnected. And I felt that potentially there was a way to reconnect us through art and through a painting. But I didn't quite know how that was gonna happen. And what I found, which was, something extraordinary and really powerful was if we focus on our intentions, the intentions with which we do something, that's when real power happens. And the world had really changed. The things that resonated and vibrated with people pre-COVID don't vibrate and resonate with people any, anymore. It's a completely different landscape. And a lot of people are being very slow to sort of catch on to the change. It's a very real change. And that change is such that pre-COVID, we were obsessed with celebrity. We were obsessed with hierarchy. We were obsessed with cultural order. We were obsessed with the idea that some people are more important than others. And COVID-19 was the great leveler of us as humanity. It leveled us all. It showed us that we are all equal. And it gave us a lesson that I think we can learn from, which is that there's a beautiful teaching of universal consciousness, the understanding that we are all one. Each soul is linked. The water, the mountains, the rivers, the trees, everything within us, within our planet, is made up of one soul, and we are linked, universal consciousness. And 
within that beautiful understanding of universal consciousness, the only thing that has power within that realm is our intentions, the intentions with which we do something. And I think I started this journey and I thought, I want to make a painting called The Journey of Humanity. I want it to begin at the bottom with the soul of the earth. I want it to move up into our planet, into nature, to show the mountains, the rivers, the trees, the oceans, the lakes, the mountains rising up out of the lakes, to show the beauty and majesty of our planet that we haven't looked after. And then move next up into humanity itself, the nurturing love of the mother, the guidance and protection of the father, as they guide their child through life and protect their child and enable their child to feel safe, loved and brave. The only three things that matter feeling safe, loved, and brave, then the child can grow their wings and make their dreams come true. And enter the final section, the solar system. And that's where their dreams do come true and the possibilities become infinite. And that was the idea of the painting. And at that point, we were approached by four of the most respected entities in the world. UNICEF, UNESCO, the Global Gift Foundation, and Dubai Cares. And we then created a partnership with Dubai Cares, His Excellency Tarek Al Ghul, under His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum's global initiatives with Atlantis The Palm. And we created this beautiful partnership whereby we could amplify our project and we could then bring in the UN entities such as UNESCO, UNICEF, UNHCR, and a beautiful charitable foundation led by Eva Longoria and Maria Bravo, the Global Gift Foundation. And bringing all these entities together, we found that the awareness that we could provide for our project and the amount of people we could connect to could become limitless. And at that point, we were actually set a, a KPI by our partners, which was Dubai Cares and Atlantis The Palm. And they said, we want you to connect with a billion people around the world with this project and we'll help you. And at that point, we, we thought, wow, that's a big number. And we got to 500 million and we thought we've done well, but how on earth do we get to another 500 million? And I think it was about five days ago that it was confirmed by Google that we have actually reached and connected 2.5 billion people in this project globally, which is a third of the world's population. And it was then that I realized maybe that's the message here. If one man can spend 11 months, 20 hours a day, creating this paint using 1,400 gallons of paint, 1,000 brushes, for 11 months, 20 hours a day, imagine what 7.5 billion people could do together. And that I think is the message. If we stop the nonsense, if we stop the discrimination, if we, just, if we stop with the, uh, the hatred, the stupidity and hatred and discrimination, and we unite as humanity, imagine what we could achieve. And I think now there is a moment in history where we can unite humanity, we can connect, but the path ahead must be taken correctly. And there are many ways to go that are the wrong way. So it's gonna be an interesting time ahead. Now, I mean, a tremendous achievement. And as you said, that connectivity that you've put in place, that you actually, you see the interest. But one thing also that's, you know, close to your heart, and well done to all the great supporters that you've had here, you know, and as you said, even, you know, Atlantis and Tim Kelly making sure that, you know, he's he's got this focus and he's looking after you in that sense, you know. Um, you know, you've had some great opportunities, but there are so many people in the world, and particularly when something like this hits, that are the most vulnerable in the world, and they tend to be the children when they don't get the opportunity you know, they're never going to be able to aspire. So how important is it that the aid agencies and the people who are there, you know, that can actually help do something at that level, the way, yes, it's the parents and it's the teachers, it's everybody, but if those children don't have opportunity, you know, there is no future for them. Well, that is the point. I mean, that's a, that's a fantastically important point that you make and question that you pose to me. And it's something that has been on my mind every minute of the day since I was, I guess, since I was about 22 years old. My work for the last 25 years has been mainly, predominantly, as a humanitarian. I feel that, as an artist, the most important thing to do is to focus on living your life in grace. Because if you don't live your life in grace, whatever you create has no meaning or poignancy in this world. But if you focus as an artist on how you live, and how you treat others, then what you make, what you create, will have poignancy and beauty. 
And so I spent 25 years of my life working with children. Um, I've been to the 42 main refugee camps of the world. I spent five years doing that, creating paintings in the camps and trying to link to these children and find the beauty within them and express it and share it with the world and raise money and awareness and bring it back to the camps to help these children. So I've been on an incredibly rich and beautiful journey with these children. And there is a few lessons that get learned on that journey. One is, if there's a few lessons, so let me try and order it in my head. Um, but the first thing is, you see these children, orphaned refugees, and they have nothing. They have no home and no parents. And yet, they have a smile in their eyes that is so beautiful that would put most of us to shame. The love they have in their eyes and their heart. It's the closest thing to the soul of the earth. It's the closest thing to our God or our creator. It's the most beautiful thing on this planet. And it's something we need to learn from. The biggest mistake we make in life is our greatest gift that we are ever given is our childhood. It's the greatest gift we are ever given. And yet, it's the first thing in life that we are taught or encouraged to move on from and forget. I say to my own five-year-old, you're a big girl now, you're growing up, you know, we encourage our children to grow up and leave childhood and, and mature into adulthood. In reality, we should do exactly, completely the opposite. We should focus with everything we have to keep the child within us, keep that child within us alive forever because that is the beauty and the magic of our existence. That is the thing closest to the soul of the earth and clo to, closest to our creator. And that is where we come from and that is our beauty and that is what we have become so far detached from in the last 20 years. And I believe that actually in reality, we should spend more time learning from our children than we do trying to teach them because there's something beautiful a child can teach you in an instant. If you put four children in a sandpit of any color, creed, religion, financial background, social background, you put these four, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds in a sandpit, they will only ask one question, two questions, and they won't ask it audibly. They'll ask it in their head or in their heart. They'll say, are you kind? Will you play with me? That's it. A child will play with anyone. All they ask is, are you kind? Will you play with me? They don't care what color, religion, background, financial, social, they don't care. Are you kind? Will you play with me? And that's more poignant than we realize because that's what a child sees in another human being. But as an adult, imagine if we asked those two questions. Imagine if we said to each other, are you kind? Let's talk. Instead, we have all these premeditated questions in our mind that create distance between us and disconnect us from humanity. And that's a huge mistake. So, in answer to your question, I, this project, the whole point of this project is that we are going to auction the painting. We now split it up into 70 panels and we have six auctions around the world. And we're so lucky that we've been approached by some of the most important entities there are globally such as the World Economic Forum, where I'll be speaking and we'll be having an auction, such as um, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, such as Paris UNESCO headquarters, um, in London as well, in Dubai as well, at Atlantis. We'll be doing six auctions around the world and we're hoping to raise $30 million for these children, to help these children. But I think the important point here is, the way that you help children is not through numbers and ticking boxes. It's through the intentions with which you omit. It's the intentions with, it, with which you do something that send ripple effects around the world and actually create something powerful, a movement, a legacy that can continue to help these children around the world. The biggest mistake we make is this word CSR, which companies and corporates take on as a tick box thing that they need to have a good CSR program. But most of them don't understand what CSR actually means. CSR is defined as corporate social responsibility. It's nonsense. It shouldn't be referred to as responsibility. None of us have a responsibility to do this and we shouldn't see it as a responsibility. We should see it as our DNA, as what we are made of, as our soul. Because 
if we can understand that by helping others, we can help each and every aspect of our planet and ultimately the soul of the earth, that's how we will really help others in a deep and meaningful way, not by thinking it's our responsibility, because then we are detached from the reality and the power of that, the intention. And that's where it really all comes from. And that's how we can do something special and how we need to do something to help these children around the world in a more meaningful way. And the way to do that is to visit these camps, go to the, the refugee camps, go to the orphanages, go to the poorest communities of the world, the shanties in, in, uh, in South America, the refugee camps in Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, the slums of India, Pakistan, Indonesia, um, the townships of South Africa. Visit these places, see these children, connect with them and make a meaningful change in their lives, not by ticking a box on a form and calling it CSR. Now, of course, when we look at what happens within corporates, and I, I, I completely agree with what you're talking about in many ways, you know, forget CSR, it should be your license to operate, it should be what you do, it should be very much, again, the heart and soul of the company. And I remember being in a refugee camp in Jordan, actually, that Fadi Gandur, you know, former, you know, Fadi in the region here, um, was working so hard and I mean and just and again what I discovered was art and I discovered creativity too with the children so what you're talking about there yes it's you know are we kind do we play with each other do we talk what can corporates do and particularly corporates who might be looking at helping projects like this and making sure that you know the end result is for the greater good of humanity and for you know particularly a cause like yours for for children well I mean that's again another interesting question I think I've worked, as I said, for 25 years in, in charitable projects with various foundations around the world. And sadly, you know, this is, this is an opportunity to speak honestly and say something that may be on a lot of people's minds that, but that a lot of people may not say. Sadly, a lot of charities around the world do not do what they should be doing with the money. A lot of the money is wasted. Um, I've seen it myself. A lot of the money is wasted in uh, salaries, in um, uh, unnecessary expenses and infrastructure that is all unnecessary. And what my advice would be, I mean, I don't wanna to presume to be so arrogant as to give advice in this area, but all I can give, all I can tell you is my own personal experience. And you, in our project, to give you an understanding, we have 10 people who, are, who have worked for 11 months with zero salary, zero expenses. They take a taxi from A to B, they pay it out of their own money. They have a sandwich, they pay it out of their own money. There is zero expenses, there is zero salary. They are working on this project from here, from their heart, because their intentions are to make a change and make a difference. And that has so much more power than these larger organizations that potentially sometimes are very salary driven and how very expense driven. Um, but at the same time, you need these organizations. You need them and you also need the other side of it. And the other side of it is these smaller institutions and foundations and charitable entities and projects that are run by people who have an intention to change things, an intention to help, and they have an understanding of love and empathy. Empathy is a word that has been very undervalued. And empathy is one of the most important things that we can possess and amplify within our hearts because empathy is the thing that makes us human. And to the antithesis of maybe the direction the world is going in, the world seems to think that our future is technology. I would suggest that our future is not technology. Our future is human. I would suggest that our future is human. If we want to live in a more conscious and amplified manner with more empathy and love, and we wanna be more successful, we need to concentrate on what makes us human. Technology should be used to facilitate and to, and to help us achieve various things, but it should not be technology driven. It should be human driven. And the understanding of humanity is empathy. So as, a, as a, a corporate looking at which charitable foundations to support, 
I would look at what are their levels of empathy and understanding? What is it that they themselves feel passionate about? And where are their intentions really lying? Not what do they think they should be doing or what is their secret agenda? Or if they give money to this entity, maybe they'll get something in return or maybe they'll get favors from this person. That's fine and that works, but it doesn't work in the larger scheme of our universe. It doesn't work in the larger scheme of humanity. What works is finding something you're passionate about, that you really have real intentions to do something about, and then look into the people that are really changing those landscapes and spend a lot of time with them on the ground at the camps, meeting these children, and find out how you can help in a really meaningful way. That I think is the way to do it. And with our, our project, it, it's exciting because we are gonna be doing these auctions around the world and we're hoping that it will send these ripple effects of good intentions, of empathy and love. And we're hoping to link with various corporates who can support us and help us. And I hope that some of them are looking out and that they, they'll, they'll help us on this journey. There's not much more I can say than that. And indeed, I'm sure there are so many. And as you said, you know, that technology there very much as a sort of the conduit to bring everybody together. You know, the billions of people who are watching what you do and looking at it, and I know I'm sure for the auction and that technology will play its role, but it's going to, to facilitate that. But that, that, that movement and that initiative has to be made by the people. Many questions in here, and many of them connected actually from Claire Johnson, the UK, Noor, uh, so I mean, um, Wayne Fullard, a lot of that in terms of, and in a kind of, I suppose, a, a wrap up on this too, you know, kind of where, where does, where do we go from here? We're seeing the great leveler, as you said, that COVID has put the brakes on, we have to move forward. And um, just to also make sure that we can catch up with you while you're here. So um, we'd love to hear more from you, but we don't have much time. But where are we going to see you in the next while? I believe you're going to stay around Dubai for a while and maybe we can come and see some more of your great work and hear your, your wisdom. Um, that's kind, firstly. <laughs> um, I am in Dubai at the moment. We're actually going to do a little secret unveiling at the Leila Heller Gallery on Wednesday night in Al Sakal, where you'll see a little sneak preview of the journey of humanity. That's really exciting alongside my 18 year retrospective. And then the big one is on the 25th of February when we unveil the entire 17 and a half thousand square foot painting, um, the world record for the largest painting ever created by a single man and for the largest social artistic philanthropic project in history. It's really exciting. We're unveiling at Atlantis the Palm on the 25th of February. The painting will be there for a week. As I said, I cut it up and now we reconfigure it like a jigsaw and the whole thing gets put together and you can see it for the first time on the 25th of February. It'll be there for a week. And then after that, we go on a tour around the UAE and a virtual tour around the world. Um, luckily with our two partners that we've been lucky enough to have, which is Google Arts and Culture um, and Facebook, Facebook for Good, where we are linking with them. And as you say, technology is a facilitator to humanity nothing more powerful and a necessity, obviously. And we will be facilitating, we will be reaching into what Google and Facebook can do for us to actually digitally put our painting around the world in the top museums of the world for the next six months. So anyone in Paris, London, New York can go into a museum and see the entire painting reconfigured as a hologram projection, which is so exciting. And then we move on to our six auctions where we raise the money to hopefully help change these children's lives well, we can empower them to change their future. The idea is the great, great leveler has been COVID and it gives us an opportunity to press the reset button and make a societal and sustainable change. However, the biggest divide in the world at the moment is those with the internet and those without. And the thing that is extraordinary is how many children and families and communities are without the internet around the world. And our great aim, with the help of our partners, His Excellency Tarek Al Gurg and Dubai Cares, is to put the internet in every single one of the poorest communities of the world, the refugee camps, the favelas, the shanties, the townships, the slums, give them the internet and bring education in through the connections and partnerships we've made with the departments of the ministries of education around the world, bringing in education into their communities through the internet, where we can then set up a scholarship fund 
where they can get into a school in their area and then a university and then potentially a child from the slum of India or a township in South Africa can, can become a human rights lawyer at Columbia University. And then where will they put that? They'll put it back into their community. And all we need is five success stories around the world. And that's how we can change the world. Five success stories from each community whereby they have the internet, they go to school, they go to university, they become a human rights lawyer, and they put everything that they've got back into their community because that's what they'll do. That's how we can change the world. We can give education to everybody, every soul and every child through putting the internet in every community. And that is our greater aim here. And that is just, it's, it's so important. I think universally, it's the thing that has to be done. We have no more time. I, I wish we would. I want to wish you, you know, from all of us at ABLF, the very, very best on your journey. Um, you know, there's so much, obviously, that you still have to do. And hopefully before you leave Dubai, we'll catch up with you and have a look at some of those pictures and be able to maybe look and feel. And of course, digitally, the world can see it. So Thanks. once again, Sasha, it's been an absolute delight to have you here at ABLF. It's been a real joy, real joy for me to talk to you. And good luck with everything. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much. I hope you found that inspiring. And of course, um, you can connect online just to see some of that great work. I'm sure you'll just be blown away with the magnitude. And indeed, when we hear the story that goes behind it, how wonderful that is. Stay with us um, on ABLF. We'll be right back. Thank you so much.